Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to the maybe most important poem in Leaves of Grass, certainly some have considered it the masterpiece of Leaves of Grass, When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloom. This will be now a set of comments that are introductory to the 16 sections that we will look at here in a moment. Of course, this is the famous elegy for President Lincoln, though interestingly his name is never actually mentioned in the poem. Much has been uh, made of this. Now our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net down that left hand side, Talks with Walt, we're calling our playlist. And everything from the very first word come, the invitation word through all the inscriptions, poems, obviously Song of Myself. We're going to talk about Song of Myself and especially passages 5 and 6 a number of times in our study of this poem. We've given a set of introductory comments to the intro to the memories of President Lincoln. This poem and three others will be a part of this section following drum taps. And when we hit drum taps, I suggested to you that if Whitman was considering that he was considering the new American Bible, as he, record, as he, as he kind of referred to it, that we were really into the section of lamentations. And certainly with this elegy, that's where we will be. Now, um, my hope is that you've watched that set of introductory comments because I'm not going to go over some of that information as I now introduce us to uh, Lilacs. Now, as we've been doing um, already, we've got some introductory comments from Norton's that we want to get some background information for. Norton's will say it this way about Lilacs. This, gate, this great trinity, that is to say a lament, called by Swinburne, quote, the most sweet and sonorous nocturne ever chanted in the church of the world, end quote, pretty amazing line, was composed in the weeks immediately following Lincoln's assassination, April 14, 1865, to become the title poem of the sequel of 18 poems comprising 24 pages, which was printed in the fall to be bound in with drum taps. In 1871-76, it headed the group entitled President Lincoln's Burial Hymn, which was given its present title in the final grouping of 1881. A few minor revisions were made, both in 1871 and 1881. For example, in 1871, the refrain, The Carol of the Bird, was italicized for the first time, and the felicitous pray, uh, phrase, quote, Retrievements out of the night, end quote, was added to line 198. In the Feinberg collection, two manuscript pages containing a list of about 90 words expressive of sorrow, evidently compiled by the poet in working on his elegy. And also, there are six small notebook pages of manuscript jottings on the hermit thrush. John Burroughs is quoted now as saying, he, Whitman, is deeply interested in what I tell him of the hermit thrush. And uh, Burroughs is the one who made this comment to Myron B. Benton in September of 1865. He continues, and Whitman says, he has used largely the information I've given him in one of his principal poems, end quote. Norton's continues, such evidences are interesting, but can throw little light upon the processes which produce this masterpiece. Its secret lies profoundly in the depths of the poet's own involvement, and yet it is controlled and objective in its accomplishment. The subtle counterpoint of the three basic symbols, the lilacs of perennial spring, the poet's love, the fallen western star, obviously Lincoln, the song of the hermit thrush, the chant of death, as well as the complex interplay of subsidiary uh, symbols, the universalizing of the poet's grief, the evocation of the awesome procession of death, the, the train through the 1600 miles back home, the ecstatic and reconciling carol, which is lyric within a lyric, all these are composed into a mighty structure of genius. It is a structure which resembles music in that it is its own being, its own experience of emotions that matters, not its meaning. Whitman's observation of Lincoln as the representative democratic man, the living symbol in many respects of his own message to America, was unremitting. And then several notations are suggested on Lincoln in Specimen Days. We're going to quote a couple of these. And his memorial lectures, Death of Abraham Lincoln, and Abraham Lincoln uh, as well, a, a speech that he gave. Lincoln died on the morning of April 15, 1865. And after remaining in Washington until April 21st, his body was carried in the long procession through American cities, including Baltimore, Harrisburg, Philadelphia, New York, Albany, Buffalo, 
Cleveland, Columbus, Indianapolis, and Chicago. Interment took place at Springfield, Illinois on May the 4th. Now about the reference to lilacs in the first line, the lilacs almost universal adaptability, Norton's will say, uh, uh, combined with its beauty, made it the most familiar American dooryard shrub in ancient design, especially in Persian art and literature, the lilac flower with its heart-shaped leaves and its lobed, panicular um, spire or blossoms, acquired erotic significance as a masculine principle in Whitman's plant symbolism of male com com comradeship, calumnus, sweet flag, maple-bearded moss, etc. The lilac occasionally appears but here it achieves the loftiest transcendence in its dedication to the national martyr, Lincoln, obviously. Speaking in his Lincoln lecture of the fateful day, April 14th, Whitman said, quote, I remember when I was stopping at the time, the season being advanced, there were many lilacs in full bloom. By one of those caprices that uh, enter and give tinge to events without being at all a part of them, I find myself always reminded of the great tragedy of that day by the sight and odor of these blossoms, end quote. Confirming this association without reference to, uh, what, to Whitman, Julia Taft, friend from childhood of Lincoln's children, reports of her brother, the surgeon, uh, Colonel uh, Charles S. Taft, who uh, attended the dying president through the night, quote, the yard of the house was full of blossoming lilacs, and as long as Charlie Taft lived, the scent of lilacs brought back the black horror of that dreadful night. And then Norton finishes by pointing out that in the second line, the great star is in fact Venus, low in the western sky at the time of Good Friday, when in fact Lincoln will pass. Now, our approach here <clears throat> will uh, be to pay attention to some of this background information. For example, uh, there's a few quotes here that can help to, to kind of set the stage for our study of this poem. Whitman will, uh, will uh, tell us in Specimen Days, Quote, the day of the murder, is what he calls the assassination, we heard the news very early in the morning. He was with his mother. Mother prepared breakfast and other meals afterward, as usual, but not a mouthful was eaten all day by either of us. We each drank half a cup of coffee. That was all. Little was said. We got every newspaper morning and evening and the frequent extras of that period and passed them silently to each other. Um, and then um, just a few... Uh, a few days into the whole experience, um, Whitman will, uh, will remind himself that he said this of Lincoln, quote, I, full, I, I believe fully in Lincoln, all right, this is in a letter from 1863, he's just reminiscing now, few know the rocks and quicksands he has to steer through. Uh, Lincoln was actually there for the second inauguration, just weeks, obviously, before the, uh, the terrible assassination. And in specimen days, he pointed out about the president that he looked very much worn and tired. Some of you have probably seen pictures of this where Lincoln just deteriorated over the course of those four years. The lines, indeed, of vast responsibilities, intricate questions and demands of life and death cut deeper than ever upon his brown, dark brown face. Yet all the old goodness, tenderness, sadness, and canny shrewdness underneath the furrows. I never see that man without feeling that he is one to become personally attached to, for his combination of purest, heartiest tenderness and native western form of manliness. Now, we are going to take the approach of looking at the three basic symbols, as we've said already, the lilacs, obviously, the poet Whitman, and of course his affection. The fallen Western star, obviously, uh, the the uh, uh, Venus, as we've as we've commented on already, and then a fi and then finally the a song of the uh, of the hermit thrush, which will be a chant of death, possibly uh, the poet himself. Um, actually, um, Whitman will say it this way about uh, the planet Venus. Whitman will write, "Nor earth nor sky ever knew spectacles of superber beauty." than some of the nights lately here, the western star Venus in the earlier hours of evening has never been so large, so clear. It seems as if told something, as if it held rapport indulgent with humanity and with us Americans. Now we're going to focus on the music of this, uh, of this poem. It is, it is an amazing poem to read out loud. We're going to enjoy that. 
many have pointed out that there is a whole lot of reliance upon opera. We've commented already that Whitman as, as person and Whitman as poet was very influenced by opera. The elegy, of course, will, will be rooted in certain kinds of operatic tendencies like the aria. We'll think of the song, the song of the thrush, for example. Um, we're going to point out that Whitman in this poem will move from personal to impersonal to, I'm going to argue, transpersonal by the end, and his whole notion of reconciliation. It will be, of course, a poem that will capture the poetry of loss, and in that regards, a what we've been calling sustained theodicy. In other words, why do bad things have to happen? Why must we have gone through this terrible war? That was the whole point of drum taps. And then as soon as the war is ended, the one most responsible for keeping the union together dies? It just makes no sense at all. How, how can we explain that? And I think that Whitman as instructor or teacher is definitely trying to console the student reader when he plays the game of lilacs. We're going to follow in some ways a very traditional study of the 16 sections. We're going to use a four-part kind of declension, so we'll have, at least, we'll have at least four lectures that will allow us to kind of focus specifically in uh, what is sometimes referred to as cycles, cycle one, sections one through four, where we're going to be introduced to the setting. We're going to see the three symbols, of course, of the lilacs, the star, Venus, and, and, the, and the thrush. And then in the second cycle of sections five through nine, we're going to look at the journey of the coffins, the, that's some 1,600 miles that would find its way ultimately to Springfield, the uh, coffin laid in a train and then the train slowly making its way across America. Um, we're going to pay attention to other symbols as well, the, cl the cloud symbol, the swamp symbol, we'll come back. In this third cycle of sections 10 through 13, we're going to ask, Whitman's going to ask the question, how uh, will I sing? And we're going to note the natural objects, the phenomena that will be a part of this as it relates, obviously, to Lincoln's immortality as, as Whitman will begin to play the game. Um, and then in the fourth cycle, sections 14 through 16, we're going to get a restatement of the earlier themes and symbols. In section 14, we're going to get this amazing song of the thrush, which will take us back to Out of the Cradle Endlessly Rocking when we played, when we played that game, um, which is a song which seems to praise death, and so we're going to look at that as well. And we'll read that in connection to our study of Song of Myself, Passage 6. And then finally, of course, the ending of the coffin's journey will arrive. We're going to point out the significance of Good Friday or Easter as being the moment when Lincoln dies. That is to say, there's going to be a lot about rebirth and resurrection and reconciliation at the end of this poem. And finally, we'll make some observations at 3A as we're trying to relate this poem to other, to other texts and other ideas that there's a whole lot of Dante in this poem. Uh, I think that, Whit that Whitman was very influenced by Dante, as we've said so many times, but I think he's very going to be very influenced by Dante in this poem, and we'll point out the ways in which that happens. Obviously, Milton and his, and his great elegy, uh, Lycidas, I've already given lectures at LearnStrong.net over Dante and Milton and those, and those two poems. We're going to point out as well the significance of the contemporary poet Tennyson in this poem. There, there's a whole lot to be made of Tennyson's view of death. Of course, we can think about Ulysses. Um, and to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bounds of human thought and all of that. We've given full lectures on that as well at LearnStrong.net, but we'll, we'll, be, we'll be talking about that. And, of course, we're, as we've already said, we're going to look at Song of Myself, Passage 6 again, and his musings on death as they will relate to this reading. There's so many echoes. It's one thing, I'll say it this way, it's one thing to pick up when Lilac Slice in the Door Air Bloom and just read it, and many have. And, in fact, there are many readers of... This poem that never read anything else in Leaves of Grass. This is the only poem that they'll know about, and I and, and that's fine. And hopefully our comments will help you to be a reader of that. But for those of us that start and read every single line of all of Leaves of Grass to this point, you can make the argument that Whitman is building all the way from the very first word come to this moment. And that lilac serves as the very pulse, the very heartbeat of all of Leaves of Grass. Certainly that argument has been made and we'll be looking at it. And then I'm going to make the argument by the end of our time together with this poem that I think T.S. Eliot was very influenced by uh, this poem. You'll remember in East Cochrane, that passage we've given full lectures over all of the four poems of Four Quartets. You'll remember in East Cochrane that um, he's playing that game of the wounded surge implies the steel that questions the distempered part. 
and the whole notion of we call this Friday good, I think this idea of Lincoln dying on a Good Friday and the idea of the resurrection themes and obviously the myth of the phoenix bird and all of that will play into our study as well. So I, uh, I, I welcome you to come back to us and we will begin our study of the first cycle and uh, we'll be blown away by the majesty of this amazing poem. Thank you.